Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will actually prove some of the properties of the roots. So, which will be uh, used later in the classification of uh, semi simple Lie algebras. So, let us begin. So, first I will recall uh, what we have done so far. So, we started with G being finite dimensional semi simple Lie algebra. over C and then we have chosen a maximal total subalgebra. So, let us say H is a maximal total subalgebra of G. So, that means, so the elements of H they are all add semi simple elements. Okay. So, elements of H are all add semi simple. So, that means elements inside G. So, that means add x. So, when you take x from H they all act semi simply on G act semi simply on G. So, now not only that any total subalgebra we proved that it must be abelian. So, in particularly this H is actually abelian subalgebra of G. So, in particularly, so if you take this adjoint action and then restrict it to H, so then each element of H act semi simply on G since they all mutually commute. So, they so all the elements of H acts simultaneously diagnosably on G. So, in particularly we can talk about uh, root space decomposition of G. So, let us recall what it is. So, you write G as G naught direct sum direct sum G alpha where alpha coming from phi. So, where G alpha is defined to be so those x in G such that when you act by elements of H via adjoint action then that actually gives us alpha of H x for all H in H. So, this is the definition of uh, G alpha for alpha in H star. So, in particularly G naught is uh, defined to be the centralizer of this H. So, which is uh, those elements of x that commutes with H. So, we indeed proved that this G naught is nothing but H itself. So, if we start with maximal total subalgebra then the centralizer of that uh, maximal total subalgebra inside G must be equal to H. So, this is something we have already proved. So, with this uh, we have this uh, root space decomposition. So, let me write it again. So, G is equal to H direct sum direct sum G alpha alpha in phi. So, that is how we have. So, where phi is nothing but those alpha in H star difference 0 such that this G alpha is being non, non 0. So, these uh, elements of phi they are called roots. So, these are all the set of roots. Of course, these roots are associated with G with respect to the action of H. So, then we can say that this is the set of roots. So, with respect to the pair G comma H. Okay. So, now uh, these G alphas uh, we already seen that for alpha in phi we call this G alpha as root spaces. Okay. So, in particularly we have what is called this uh, root space decomposition of G. with respect to of course, the cartan that we have fixed. So, what we want to uh, do now? We want to understand the properties of this uh, roots as well as the properties of this root spaces. So, indeed we will prove that all these root spaces they have dimension 1 and uh, this set of roots uh, they will form a root system in the sense of. So, we will define what it is uh, later. Okay, so, uh, before uh, moving forward, uh, we will actually recall some of the facts uh, that we have already proved. So, we have this killing form that is defined on G. 
So, when we restrict this killing form to H so that must be non-degenerate. So, killing form that is defined on G that is non-degenerate and again if you restrict that to this maximal toral subalgebra, so that is also non-degenerate. So, this is something we have already proved. So, we also proved something more about uh, this orthogonality relations between these root spaces with respect to the killing form. So, if we take kappa of G alpha and G beta, so that will be always 0 if alpha plus beta is actually non-zero. So, you take alpha beta inside H star such that this alpha plus beta is non-zero. So, then this G alpha and G beta they must be orthogonal to each other. So, these things we have already proved. So, let us uh, use them and then derive some properties of this uh, set of roots. So, what we do now we just uh, want to prove various properties of these uh, uh, roots. So, let us fix this uh, notation phi which is as above. So, let us say phi this is the set of roots. So, with respect to that uh, pair g comma h. So, this is something we are fixing. So, now what is the first fact about uh, this phi? So, this phi if you take as a subset of this h star. So, first of all this is a finite subset. So, this is a finite subset of h star and note that 0 is not in phi. So, this is uh, one important property. So, if we think about it actually if we take this span of this phi, so then that must be exactly equal to h star. So, this is something uh, one can prove. So, on the contrary assume that this span of phi is actually proper. Okay. So, otherwise let us say this span of phi is proper. So, this is our claim span of phi must be equal to h star. So, now if we look at the dual uh, space of this, so that means the dual of uh, this fan phi inside h. So, then what we get? So, then there exist h inside your h which is non-zero such that this alpha of h will be 0 for all h in h. So, this is uh, one one can this one can get it from uh, by looking at the dual of uh, span phi inside h. So, <coughs> because there is some h in h such that which is non-zero element such that alpha of h is 0. So, then we can simply calculate uh, how this h will act on g. So, recall that so h is going to act on h by 0 for all h dash in h and if you compute h with any x where let us say x is coming from g alpha then this bracket h x is nothing but given by alpha of h x. But since alpha of h is 0, so you get the bracket h x is equal to 0. So, this means this bracket of h g alpha is 0 for all alpha in phi. So, now put together all this you can see that the bracket h with uh, g is actually 0. So, that means h must lies inside the center of g, but we know that since g is semi simple Lie algebra the center must be 0. So, that proves that h must be 0 which is actually a contradiction because we started with h which is non-zero. So, that means this span of phi cannot be actually proper. So, it must be equal to h star. So, this is something very important property of this set of roots. So, now let us see other properties. So, the second property if we take alpha from phi. So, then one can prove that minus alpha also must be inside phi. So, indeed we will prove that uh, if alpha is in phi then plus or minus alpha are the only multiples of real multiples of alpha inside phi or even complex multiple of alpha in phi. So, 
we will do that later we need uh, some SL2 representation 3 to prove that, but this fact is easy. Let us say uh, you have alpha in phi, so if this is not true, let us say it is not true. So, then there exist alpha in phi such that minus alpha is not in phi, but then look at what happens to the killing form. Okay. If I take the killing form with the g alpha with the g beta, so then this must be 0 for all beta in phi not only in beta and phi as well as for beta 0 also this must be true. Why this is the case because alpha plus beta will be never 0 because beta cannot be minus alpha or beta yeah if it beta 0 again it cannot be minus alpha. So, that says that alpha plus beta being never 0. So, that implies the cap of g alpha comma g beta must be 0. But then this implies immediately that kappa of g alpha with g that must be 0. So, that means g alpha lies inside the radical of kappa, but since kappa is non degenerate. So, the radical of kappa must be 0. So, that implies that g alpha must be 0, but that is contradiction for the definition of elements of phi because we collected elements of phi. So, that g alpha are non 0. Okay, so, this is a contradiction. So, that proves that uh, the bracket uh, sorry if alpha is in phi then minus alpha also must be in phi. So, now we claim that what will happen if we take uh, the bracket between g alpha and g minus alpha. So, we claim that it must be at most one dimensional. So, let uh, alpha in phi. So, then we have so, the bracket between g alpha and g minus alpha, so that is subset of C t alpha. So, more precisely we can actually tell what will be the bracket in terms of the killing form. So, for example, if I take x in g alpha and then y is in g minus alpha. So, then if we take the bracket between these two elements bracket x y. So, then that must be equal to cop of x y times t alpha. So, recall that the t alpha is defined to be uh, use defined using the killing form that is restricted to h. So, we identified h with h star using the killing form in particularly given element pi inside h star. So, we associated uh, this t pi inside h. So, that the kappa of t pi comma x is nothing but pi of x for all x in h. Okay. So, using uh, this equation the t pi are defined uniquely. So, for alpha in phi we denoted t alpha by the corresponding elements. So, in particularly this t alpha is coming from uh, that alpha. So, so, you have this bracket x y that is actually equal to uh, cup of x y uh, times t alpha. So, in particularly the bracket g alpha comma g minus alpha. So, that is actually at most one dimensional. So, let us try to prove it. So, the proof is again simple computation. So, you take again alpha in phi and x in g alpha y is in g minus alpha. Then for any h in h let us compute uh, for any h in h let us compute this cap of h comma bracket x y using the associative of associativity of kappa. So, kappa of h comma the bracket x y. So, this is actually given by kappa of bracket h x comma y using the associativity. So, then this is exactly equal to. So, recall the bracket h x is nothing but alpha of h x okay, because x is coming from as x is coming from g alpha. So, in particularly this is nothing but alpha of h x. So, you get uh, exactly equal to kappa of alpha of h x comma y. So, now you can take out this alpha of h. So, then you get alpha of h times this kappa of x comma y. So, now recall that. 
So, alpha of h is actually given by kappa of t alpha comma h. So, using this definition of t ok. So, we have this kappa of t pi comma x is nothing but pi of x for all x in h and uh, pi in h star. So, in particularly we have this alpha of h equal to kappa of t alpha comma h. So, then if you substitute that there then we get uh, alpha of h to be kappa of t alpha comma h times this kappa of x comma y. So, now what we can do we can take out this kappa of x comma y inside. So, then we get kappa of kappa of x comma y times t alpha comma h. So, this is equal to the kappa of h comma bracket x y. So, in particularly you can see that if you take, so this is a killing form being symmetric. So, this we can be rewritten as kappa of h comma kappa of x comma y t alpha. So, in particularly kappa of h, so then you can take the difference between these two elements bracket x y minus kappa of x comma y t alpha. So, that must be 0 and this is true for any h in h. So, that means this element the bracket x y minus kappa of x comma y t alpha which is an element of h. So, this lies inside the radical of kappa when you restrict to h, but we know that kappa restricted to h is actually non-degenerate. So, in particularly this radical of k with respect to h is 0. So, that proves that this bracket x y minus kappa of x comma y t alpha must be 0. So, that is what we wanted to prove. We wanted to prove that the bracket x y is equal to kappa of x y times t alpha. So, this proves that if we take the bracket between g alpha and g minus alpha, so then this will be at most one dimensional. Indeed, we will prove in a minute uh, this is actually going to be equal to that uh, one dimensional space. So, that again like follows from this uh, orthogonality between g alpha and g beta. So, let us prove that. So, here is the fourth statement. So, if we take alpha in phi, so then we have the bracket g alpha g minus alpha is equal to the one dimensional space span by t alpha ok. Indeed what we do you start with x non-zero element inside g alpha. So, then uh, we will we claim that kappa of x comma g minus alpha must be non-zero. So, we claim that kappa of x comma g minus alpha must be non-zero. So, what will happen otherwise? So, otherwise the kappa of x comma g minus alpha will be 0, but then it is immediate that kappa of x comma g beta is 0 for all beta which is not equal to minus alpha ok. So, that means kappa of x comma g will become 0. So, that will imply that x v will be in the radical of kappa with respect to g, but which is also 0. So, that is a contradiction because we started with x being non-zero. So, that means this proves that there exists. So, this proves that there exists y in g minus alpha such that kappa of x comma y must be non-zero. Then just to look at this x comma y, then if you compute the bracket x y, then we know that this is exactly equal to kappa of x comma y times t alpha. So, that proves that the bracket g alpha g minus alpha is being non-zero. So, that that is actually being equal to the one dimensional space span by t alpha. So, this is something uh, proves something about the bracket g alpha and g minus alpha. So, now uh, if we actually think about a bit more. Uh, we can actually compute what will happen to alpha of t alpha. So, for alpha inside phi, so we claim that this alpha of t alpha, so which is by definition kappa of t alpha comma t alpha. So, this must be non-zero ok. So, all these things are 
later used uh, to prove that there exists a nice SL2 subalgebra for each alpha and phi. Okay, that is where we are heading. So, let us first prove this for alpha and phi, uh, this alpha of T alpha must be non zero. So, again this is done by contradiction. So, let us assume, okay. so assume that alpha of T alpha is 0. So, and then let us see what we get. If alpha of T alpha is 0, so then <coughs> if you compute T alpha bracket x, then that must be equal to uh, alpha of T alpha times x for x in G alpha. So, in particularly since alpha of T alpha is 0, so that implies T alpha x must be 0 <coughs> and this is true for all x in G alpha. So, similarly we can prove that T alpha bracket with y also must be 0 for all y in G minus alpha because again the bracket T alpha y will be minus alpha of T alpha times y but alpha of T alpha is 0. So, that implies T alpha comma y is 0. So, now we can choose x and y as in 4 okay, as above choose x in G alpha and y in G minus alpha such that the bracket x y which is kappa of x comma y T alpha which is non-zero. Okay. So, then uh, what we can do? We can replace y with some multiple of y. Okay. So, replace y with y times 1 divided by kappa of x comma y. So, then you can see that we can assume that kappa of x comma y being 1. So, by replacing this, we can assume that kappa of x comma y is actually equal to 1. So, now if we put together everything, so then what we get? So, we get the bracket x y is being T alpha and then the bracket T alpha x is being 0 and the bracket T alpha y is also being 0. So, that means if we take this capital S which is the span of all this x, y and t alpha. So, this is going to define three dimensional soluble subalgebra, soluble subalgebra of G. Okay. So, now if you look at it, uh, so this add map is actually 1 to 1. So, add is 1 to 1 from G to G L of G. So, in particularly if you restrict this add map to capital S, so then again that must be injective. So, this must be injective. So, in particularly add of this S, okay, let us put G to denote we are talking about add with respect to G. So, add G S, so this must be isomorphic to S because we are simply restricted to the image and add G is injective when we restrict to S. So, now since add S G is actually being a subalgebra of G L G which is soluble. So, then we will be able to get a basis of G so that the elements of this add S. So, they look like upper triangular matrices. Okay. In particularly, so if we take any element add small s with respect to G, so where S is coming from the derived algebra of uh, this uh, capital S, then this add S must be nilpotent. So, we use the same basis that we have actually fixed, so that all the elements of add capital S, they look like upper triangular. Now, if S is coming from the derived algebra, then you can see that the commutator of this upper triangular matrix will become strictly upper triangular matrix. So, that would imply that this add S being actually nilpotent. So, this proves that if you take uh, any element in the commutator that must be nilpotent. 
but if we go back to the uh, table you can see that the bracket x y is being t alpha ok. So, that means this t alpha so this is actually inside your the derivative algebra bracket s s. So, that means add of t alpha ok that is actually nilpotent, but since uh, this t alpha is actually coming from your uh, carton. So, that implies add t alpha add g t alpha that must be actually semi simple. So, this is semi simple. So, you have a element which is both nilpotent and semi simple inside g l of g. So, that forces that element must be 0. So, since add g of t alpha is 0 since add g is actually injective map that forces t alpha must be 0. So, that is a contradiction because t alpha chosen to be non-zero element in h that corresponds to a root alpha the root alpha. So, th this actually indeed proves that uh, alpha of h alpha alpha of t alpha cannot be actually 0 ok. So, the assumption that we have uh, made that actually uh, not correct. So, that forces that alpha of t alpha must be non-zero. So, in particularly kappa of t alpha comma t alpha that also must be non-zero. So, now let us use this uh, to establish this uh, uh, SL2 triple ok. So, we, for that let us fix uh, alpha in phi. So, then what we do we also fix some uh, non-zero element x alpha inside your g alpha. So, then what we do? So, then we can choose y alpha inside g minus alpha such that the bracket x alpha y alpha is non-zero ok. So, so then uh, using that y alpha we will be able to produce S L 2 triple. So, basically given this data alpha in phi and uh, x alpha non-zero element in g alpha. So, then we can choose y alpha inside g minus alpha such that this x alpha y alpha and then x alpha y alpha which we denoted by h alpha. So, this will make S L 2 triple. So, what is the meaning of this? The span of this will be isomorphic to S L 2 of c such that the span of this is naturally isomorphic to S L 2 of C. So, on this uh, isomorphism given very explicitly by x sending x alpha to this uh, upper triangular matrix 0 1 0 0 and then this y alpha to this lower triangular matrix <coughs> 0 1 0 0 and this h alpha to this triangle uh, diagonal matrix 1 minus 1 ok. So, this is the explicit uh, isomorphism uh, that is actually takes uh, this x alpha y alpha h alpha to respective elements in S L 2 C. So, to prove this uh, we have done already enough work. So, let us just uh, uh, rescale things and then uh, get this S L 2 triple. So, we fix this h x alpha which is uh, coming from g alpha. So, let us say this is the given non-zero element. So, now uh, since uh, kappa of g alpha comma g minus alpha is actually non-zero kappa of g alpha g minus alpha is non-zero. So, that implies that we can choose y alpha which is again non-zero element inside g minus alpha such that kappa of x alpha comma y alpha. So, that is exactly equal to twice divided by kappa of t alpha comma t alpha ok. So, because this kappa of g alpha comma g minus alpha because this is non-zero. So, this has to be equal to complex numbers entire complex numbers. So, we will be able to choose y alpha such that this happens. So, now what we do? So, we just uh, set this h alpha to be the scalar multiple of t alpha the scalar being this uh, 2 divided by kappa of t alpha t alpha. So, take uh, h alpha to be twice t alpha divided by 
cop of t alpha comma t alpha. So, then what happens uh, if we do the computation we can see that the bracket x alpha y alpha which we already computed it to be this is equal to exactly cop of x alpha comma y alpha times t alpha. So, now since cop of x alpha y alpha is given to be 2 divided by cop of t alpha t alpha. So, then you can see that this is exactly equal to h alpha. So, now moreover if you compute h alpha comma x then you can see that this is nothing but given by alpha of h alpha times x for x in g alpha. Okay. So, in particularly you can see that alpha of h alpha is given to be so h alpha is nothing but what twice t alpha divided by cop of t alpha t alpha. So, then we get alpha of h alpha equal to twice alpha of t alpha divided by cop of t alpha comma t alpha. But note that cop of t alpha comma t alpha is nothing but alpha of t alpha. So, that means so, this part is actually get cancelled and then get we get 2. So, alpha of h alpha is nothing but 2. So, this says that the bracket h alpha x alpha. So, that must be twice x alpha. Similarly, if you compute the bracket x alpha y alpha since y alpha is coming from g minus alpha. So, you get minus 2 y alpha. So, now we can write down all the uh, table. So, we have this bracket x h alpha x alpha is being 2 x alpha and bracket h alpha y alpha is being minus 2 y alpha and note that the bracket x alpha y alpha that is nothing but uh, h alpha. So, this is exactly the uh, product table for SL2C. So, that means uh, the span of x alpha y alpha h alpha that must be isomorphic to this S L 2 C. Okay. So, this tuple uh, triple okay, for alpha in, in phi. So, this three dimensional subalgebra which is spanned by uh, this x alpha y alpha and h alpha. So, that will be called the S L 2 triple of uh, corresponding to this alpha. Okay. So, this is the definition of SL2. So, naturally this is isomorphic to SL2. Okay. So, if we think about it uh, this association alpha to H alpha. So, that is also somewhat a very nice association. So, let us make this remark. So, recall H alpha is given by twice T alpha divided by uh, kappa of T alpha T alpha. So, but if we compute what happens to h of minus alpha, so then we can prove that this must be equal to minus of h alpha. So, this is again just comes from the definition. So, let us try to compute. So, what is the definition of h minus alpha? So, h minus alpha is given by twice t minus alpha divided by kappa of t minus alpha comma t minus alpha. But note that t minus alpha must be equal to minus t alpha because this alpha goes to t alpha that is a linear map in terms of alpha. So, that means this h minus alpha must be equal to minus 2 alpha divided by. So, this is kappa of uh, t pi comma t pi will be pi of t pi. So, this is just minus alpha of t minus alpha. So, then you get exactly equal to 2 t alpha divided by alpha of t alpha sorry minus there is another minus. So, this says <coughs> this is exactly equal to minus twice t alpha divided by kappa of t alpha comma t alpha. So, which is exactly minus h alpha. So, this proves that this h also behaves nicely with uh, taking negative. So, h of minus alpha must be equal to minus h alpha. So, all these uh, uh, facts again will be used uh, in order to prove more properties of this root system. So, let me just uh, recall what we have done uh, so far. So, we actually indeed proved uh, that uh, the span of phi must be h star and then 0 is not in phi 
and uh, if alpha is in phi, so then that implies minus alpha is in phi. So, if we take uh, this g alpha and g minus alpha, so we proved that this must be a one dimensional space spanned by T alpha. So, by scaling T alpha, we can also say that this is a one dimensional space spanned by this H alpha. So, now for alpha is in phi, so we constructed for given any non zero x alpha inside G alpha. So, we have constructed y alpha inside g minus alpha such that this x alpha, y alpha and then this h alpha which is defined to be the bracket x alpha, y alpha. So, this is actually forms SL2 alpha triple. So, this is the that means the span of this is isomorphic to SL2 of alpha. So, this is what uh, we have proved so far, this is the very important uh, result. So, on the way we also observe that alpha of T alpha, so that must be non-zero which is kappa of T alpha comma T alpha, so that must be non-zero. So, these are all things uh, that we have proved. So, we will use uh, uh, these facts uh, later and then actually we will prove actually more properties of the root systems. So, that I will actually do it in the next class. So, I will stop now, thanks.